Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now this is an Intel Xeon E5645. When it launched in the first quarter of 2010, it was a very expensive CPU indeed. In fact, us regular consumers would have had to pay around $550 for the privilege of owning one of these 6 core 12 threaded chips. I've gone with US dollars for the currency today because I'm not sure how much it cost in the UK or mainland Europe, but it would have been a lot. These days you can pick them up for less than 10. In fact, they cost less than a fiver here in the UK. For 6 cores and 12 threads? Ridiculous. The problem with these 1366 socket chips is that the motherboards remain quite expensive. That is, if you want a decent one capable of achieving much better overclocks. The best cost effective method of obtaining one is by purchasing an old HP workstation like this Z400 here, which I paid just £50 for, and you probably remember it from the brief video I made about it a while back. Doing so can save you money, but it also means you don't get access to any overclocking features. And thanks to the proprietary wiring of the power supply, you can't replace it with a standard unit like a Corsair one for example. That means you will be limited to this 475 watt PSU and its sole 6 pin connector. Ok, so that's not entirely true, you can get an adapter in order to make aftermarket PSUs work with this machine no problem but if you don't want to spend the extra money or you plan on using a budget graphics card anyway then nothing is stopping us from taking advantage of a great entry level GPU like this 1650 Super for example a card I feel goes very nicely with the Xeon E5645 so what you're about to see is a demonstration of how this 2.4GHz chip performs at stock speeds when paired with a £150 graphics card and 8GB of DDR3. Initially after running Cinebench R20 I wasn't expecting much from the upcoming gaming tests. Its multi-core score of just over 1100 points puts it in close competition with the Ivy Bridge i5-3550 and the single core score really isn't worth talking about. But what we do have at our disposal is a plethora of cores. They might not be very powerful cores, but they are cores nonetheless, and with that, let's get into the games. First up, it's Assassin's Creed Odyssey, a title that enjoys the benefits of a vast range of threads. Thankfully, even at 2.4GHz, this chip helps to deliver at least 30fps on average with the high settings at 1080p, a resolution I've stuck firmly to in today's tests. The benchmark tends to be more intensive than actual gameplay, hence the whole point of a benchmark I guess, so bear in mind that you may not only see more frames with a higher clock speed if you have a better motherboard, or a faster graphics card, but just when running about in a different area. As I said before, I used this GPU as it was compatible with the Z400 workstation right out of the box, thanks to its single 6-pin requirement, and I feel as though this is a more realistic real-world solution. All you have to do is buy the pre-built HP, then throw the GPU inside it without any further tweaking or hassle. It's a minimum effort configuration that in return will still deliver a playable experience without spending a lot of money. As you can see Battlefield 5 is also running wonderfully in the background here, during this intense tank mission. Other games that prefer a good CPU like CSGO will run completely trouble free. We were averaging close to 200 FPS here during this Dust 2 gameplay and honestly I am so far very surprised at how this Xeon is handling itself. Now don't get me wrong, for content creation it won't be brilliant, but it's certainly worth £5 without a doubt in my mind. As I'm recording this script, the Xeon is still whirring away in the background, trying to complete a retest of the single core Cinebench R20 result. And trust me, we are a good few minutes into that test, to say the least. 
I believe we've tested the Xeon 5450 in the past and that is only a couple of pounds or dollars more so consider that option too especially if like the E5645 it can be found inside cheap pre-builds. A lot of these old Intel Xeons are still up to the job even in 2020 provided they're paired with a decent enough graphics card and at least 8 gigs of RAM. Just bear in mind the all-round cost of a setup though, once you factor in the price of some of these older motherboards, as buying a good one can be quite expensive. Exceeding 60 FPS in Kingdom Come Deliverance is also doable. I'm using the medium preset as a base here with a few things on high, and during my half hour playtime I recorded an average of 70 FPS. This figure will be closer to 55 or 60 in busier areas and settlements, and sometimes it will drop below that. I mean, here in Silver Scallets, you'll notice how the FPS can drop momentarily as we see more NPCs and an overall busier environment on screen. The average here was 60, but the 1% and especially 0.1% lows will be the numbers that are affected. Bear that in mind. It's still a playable experience, though it may be worth locking the frame rate to 60 or even 30 if you want to play at higher in-game settings. But if like me you spend more time just wandering around the countryside, then you'll definitely see higher overall figures. Either way, it's a great all-round result in this game. Metro Exodus can be a tricky one, and by that I mean it can be a pain to run smoothly, but the decade-old CPU held its own once again during this Caspian level test. Admittedly, we were a shade off 60 FPS, but 57 will do. Turning a few things down will help us hit that magic number. For me, 30 frames per second is fine in third person action games such as Assassin's Creed or Red Dead Redemption, but first person titles like Battlefield and Metro are always best experienced with as close to 60 FPS as possible, in my opinion. Okay, so just like the previous Kingdom Come Deliverance in town footage, this little bit was also an afterthought. While the game ran well when running about and doing very little, I wasn't completely satisfied with presenting these results and had to go back for a little more testing. As we made our way further into the ruins, the frame rate did get a little bit lower, but once again the biggest impact was on the 0.1% figure. The average stayed pretty much the same. I just wanted to explore these games a little more because I found they seemed to have the most variation in terms of performance and therefore frame rates. Though as you may notice we are limited by the GPU in this instance and you could in theory use a better graphics card though in some titles it wouldn't make much of a difference and as I said previously I feel like this is a more realistic combination and one that you'd be looking at if you were on a tighter budget. The Outer Worlds is another fairly new and system intensive game and it can have a real impact on both the CPU and GPU though here it held up fairly well and performed exactly as I would expect. It's quite demanding on specific hardware. On average though it was okay, just be prepared for a few dips like I said but it would also seem as though some titles would benefit from a faster GPU but others a better CPU as expected with a chip of this age. The 12 threads can't always save it from stuttery situations. Finally though, it's the most demanding game on the roster, Red Dead Redemption 2. Much to my surprise, a mixture of medium and high gave us a great result, and it would seem like a Z400 HP workstation with a 1650 Super slapped in makes for a delightful combo. Though going down this route certainly presents us with some limitations with regard to the somewhat restricted graphics card choice thanks to the OEM power supply and its one connector. However, this problem, as I said at the start, can be resolved with the use of an ATX adapter. Now, you can find these in various places. They don't cost all that much, and if you want to use a more powerful graphics card, then not only would I recommend using one of these and swapping out the power supply, but I'd also recommend upgrading to, say, 16 gigs of RAM if you plan to use something better than a 1650 Super with your Xeon. And hopefully this is something I can test out in the future when I build an entirely custom Xeon rig. Maybe even throw two of these bad boys in a system to see how well they run with the 5700 XT for example. 
I should also mention that I edited, rendered and exported this entire video using the E5645 and the experience was okay. Um, when it comes to full resolution playback, there will be a few lags, a few stutters here and there, but overall the chip didn't do too badly and you'd certainly benefit from a second one if you have a compatible motherboard. The only one looking to get into content creation with a $10 or £5 budget in mind for a CPU could do far worse, put it that way. Putting together a Xeon E5645 based build in 2020 could still prove to be a cost effective endeavour, especially with the ever shrinking prices of this often perceived as obsolete tech. You and I both know though that this old tech is the best tech of all, even if it doesn't perform the best anymore. It's certainly the most fun to mess around with, and I hope you've had just as much fun watching. By the way, the single core retest for Cinebench R20 is still going on in the background almost half an hour later, so uh, yeah, there's that to bear in mind as well. With all that said, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, you know what to do down below. Leave a like on it. If you didn't, you know what to do. Leave a dislike on it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.